Hello and welcome to Eco Magazine's takeover of the Into the Blue podcast. I'm your host, Haley, and in the second part of this deep dive series, I'm joined by Virla Huvana to find out more about habitat mapping and the floor of the deep sea. Welcome, Virli. It's nice to meet you. Can you go ahead and just give us a little brief introduction about yourself and kind of how you became to do this kind of research? Um, yeah, uh, I'm Virli Huvena. I work at the National Oceanography Center in Southampton. Um, I'm a marine researcher, a research leader is the exact title. Um, and how did I get to doing this research? <laughs> um, originally, I'm an environmental engineer or bioengineer by okay. trade. Um, so I learned soil and water management. But then at the end of my studies, I gave myself one year to study something exciting. <laughs> um, and I came to Southampton to do the masters in oceanography. And then I started looking at big water and <laughs> big ocean floor. And that's how I rolled into mapping the seafloor and the habitats that occur there. Very cool. So as far as uh, habitat mapping and like seafloor discovery and that kind of thing, um, what are some of your more recent research or expeditions or that kind of thing? So uh, we participate in several expeditions, um, typically one per year or sometimes even two per year. Uh, and the recent, the recent most ones were to Cape Verde to map some of the um, island flanks uh, and seamounts there. And then the most recent one was last August in uh, the Whitart Canyon uh, on the Celtic margin, the Bay of Biscay. Um, and we've actually done research in the Whitart Canyon for over 10 years already. We've, we've done several um, expeditions there, looking at the distribution of the habitats and the fauna that live in a submarine canyon. Very cool. So as far as some of, uh, when you do those expeditions, what are the some like main questions that you're asking or that you're interested in? So submarine canyons are very exciting systems. Um, they're very dynamic. They're complex deep sea environmental um, systems. So you have geological um, processes happening. You have sediment flows coming through the canyon. Um, you have um, steep topography. So some of the canyon walls are vertical or overhanging. Um, and that creates a lot of different niches for fauna to live in. You've also got uh, very interesting oceanographic processes with internal waves and internal tides going through the canyon. So all of that creates a lot of dynamics and therefore lots of different um, communities of fauna that live on the seabed, um, which makes it, makes it very exciting. And some of those communities are considered vulnerable marine ecosystems. So they are um, built by for example, cold water corals or sponges, and those create structure also on the seabed, and so they are con considered ecosystem engineers. And so those have to be protected because um, submarine canyons are very rich. And so as scientists, we, we have figured that out and we are interested in it, but fishermen know this as well. And so submarine canyons attract a lot of uh, fisheries okay. and that can cause quite a bit of damage sometimes. Gotcha, super interesting. So outside of those questions, what kind of technologies do you use, like measurement wise down there? Um, over the years, we've kind of developed a um, multidisciplinary uh, integrated approach. Um, as I said, there are lots of different processes happening in the canyon and you cannot really study one thing in, is in isolation. You have to see the whole package, the whole um, system at once. So we, we investigate the properties of the water column and how the currents um, act on the canyon. We investigate um, the sediment and the sediment dynamics, um, the geological formations that form the canyon, and then on top of that, um, where the, the species live. So, so for the water column, we use uh, conductivity, temperature, depth um, systems, but nowadays, increasingly, we use uh, gliders, so a type of robotic systems. Um, to map out the geology, geomorphology, we use uh, autonomous underwater vehicles, um, so AUVs, to investigate the fauna. We, we take pictures using ROVs, uh, robotic systems as well. Um, we also take um, sediment cores, very precisely located using these ROVs. So it's a, it's a multidisciplinary, multi-technology mm -hmm. integrated uh, approach. Very cool. So you've talked about some of those processes through the uh, the ocean canyons and things like that. Can you give us a little more description on 
what some of those processes are that people are researching? Um, so one of the types of processes that uh, colleagues here in the building are um, studying as well is these sediment flows. Because the canyons have such steep walls, occasionally part of them collapse and then you get a, a submarine landslide locally, but then that sediment starts mobilizing and then it becomes a turbidity current, um, so a big cloud of sediment particles and water, and that will just run down the canyon like it would do like a river. Um, and some of those are pretty powerful. They travel at speeds up to five meters per second. Um, and the particular canyon that we study is quite far from land, and people always thought that canyons that are far from land, there's not very much happening. But we have, that's another piece of equipment we have, we've put um, a mooring there uh, that measures current speeds and turbidity in the water. And we found very quickly that five, six times per year, there's a cloud of this sediment coming through. And so that has a big impact on um, the animals because if imagine you're a coral living on the on the canyon mm -hmm. walls and suddenly you get this enormous cloud coming past for a, for a day that's like that might choke you or it, mm -hmm. <laughs> it's also quite <laughs> strong current so it might break some of the coral off and um part of our research is also looking at how the ecosystems deal with that disturbance because it's a type of disturbance of their environment and how they can recover from that because, as I mentioned before, there is also a lot of fisheries happening. Mm -hmm. And so in order to learn how to manage things, um, it's good to know how natural systems can deal with recovery and how much disturbance they can deal with and how we can also help the ecosystems recover after uh, bottom fisheries, for example. Gotcha. That's super interesting. So as far as uh, some of the measurements you mentioned, like there's conductivity and salinity and things like that. What is your favorite to measure and why? <laughs> <laughs> um, because my field of research is still habitat mapping. Okay. Um, and normally we do habitat mapping by combining maps that um, depict uh, topography of the seabed, so the bathymetry. Um, we combine that with maps that show us where the sediments change sandy, rocky, muddy. Um, and then we combine that with photographs of locations. So. The instruments that help us to map out these things, so the topography and also the the type of sediment we know from acoustics. We use quite a lot of echo sounders um, that give us the depth and the strength of the echo return, which is a proxy for uh, sediment type. And then um, any of the robotics that gives us uh, the photographs of the seabed. Um, People also sometimes use other methods to understand what kind of fauna lives where, but photography is a good one because it's a non-invasive technique. Mm -hmm. We don't have to sample the animal. Occasionally we do sample some to know taxonomy in detail and to also be able to extract the DNA, for example. But um, most of the time we, it's not non-invasive and therefore we can also go back to the same location and then see how the corals have changed over time. Okay, thank you. So outside of that, um, you mentioned that, you know, habitat mapping is what you're into and in your research and what struck you as making that where you wanted to go and what, in what inspired you by habitat mapping? Um, I've always liked maps. For me, the world is a spatial place. <laughs> I need to know <laughs> where I am and how the, how the surroundings are. And I think it's a, it's a key, a habitat map is a key document for any um, person who is thinking about conservation or management of the seabed um, or of the marine environment in total. Uh, most management is based on area-based um, rules and regulations. Somebody draws a box like you cannot fish here <laughs> and you cannot take any ag extract any aggregates or oil and gas can go there. And so um, you can only do that properly if you know what's there in the ocean and that's a cliche we <laughs> we mm -hmm. still don't know from for a big part of the deep ocean we don't really know what's there um and so i think it's a very good start point um there's a bit of excitement of exploration as well of course uh, sure yeah. Yeah. yeah that's i would get super excited to kind of find something that maybe mm. no one else has before <laughs> have you ever had an instance of that um sure we've come across uh, species. I mean, if you do any research in the deep sea, um, 
And sometimes they are microscopic worms that nobody has ever described, but sometimes mm -hmm. they are corals or sponges or fish mm -hmm. or, yeah. That's so. awesome. Must be a kind of exhilarating. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Do you have any uh, future expeditions coming up or things like that? So yes, in the coming year, I have two expeditions. Um, so the previous one was part of the class program okay. um, funded by the Natural Environment Research Council. The upcoming one is also studying a submarine canyon, um, but it's offshore Italy because there the, um, the shelf is super short. <laughs> so the canyon actually, the head of the canyon comes nearly up to the shoreline. Um, uh, one of the branches of the canyon actually nearly reaches into a fishing village and the fishermen reach deep water very quickly. Um, so it's a very different setup uh, and we want to see if the dynamics in that canyon is the same um, or it's different, how much human impact there is there. I suspect there will be much more um, marine litter. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, this is also one of the topics, right? <laughs> um, there is so much rubbish on the seafloor in places that nobody has ever seen the seafloor, but there is already plastic mm -hmm. bags and bottles. Um, so that will be a very different um, setting, but maybe some of the processes like the sediment flows are still similar. Okay. And so we're going to go and study that in June uh, as part of a Eurofleet's expedition. Good. And you mentioned there was another one this year too? Um, in September, October, um, I will also participate in an expedition offshore the Galapagos okay. as part of the Schmidt Ocean uh, Institute uh, program. Um, and there the research um, is in some way also linked to what we do in the Submarine Canyon. Um, we are going to look in detail uh, at uh, fauna communities that live on vertical walls. So we have a lot of vertical cliffs in the canyons and that's where we started looking at vertical walls. And then offshore the Galapagos, because of the volcanic nature of the islands, there are also cliffs. And so the sediment dynamics and the currents there are different, but mm -hmm. still um, some of the fauna um, have the same function. And so we want to go and study how that works. Okay. Um, as far as what are some of the key questions or solutions do you think ocean mapping can provide, whether it be like through policy or management, mitigation, that kind of? So as I said, um, nearly nearly all marine management starts with area-based measures, mm -hmm. um, or a lot of marine man management is related to area-based measures. And in order to inform that, we need a good map to start off with. We need the knowledge of what's there currently. And then, um, as I was indicating before, we increasingly start to go back to places and see how things change. Uh, also spatially, if, if certain formal communities expand, move. Um, so those are some of the questions that um, marine habitat mapping can answer. I mean, there is also the, the recent UN Treaty on the High Seas, mm -hmm. um, which aims for 30 by 30, 30% 30 mm -hmm. um, conservation by uh, 2030. In order to know where to put those conservation areas, we will need information um, and um, habitat maps are a very good summary document to bring together whatever we know about um, a place. Yep. Mm -hmm. For sure, because you, if you don't know what's there, then how can you protect it? <laughs> you can protect it. There is uh, the precautionary principle, the, mm -hmm. the idea that um, we avoid moving into an area and causing harm without knowing what's there. But it is very difficult to motivate people to stick to that precautionary principle if you don't really have something mm -hmm. to show for it, um, yeah, you could you could just draw a massive box and say, okay, we don't go there ever. Mm -hmm. And for sure there will be certain ecosystems, but it's always better to know what you have in hand. And mm -hmm. yeah. Gotcha. Um, outside of, I say habitat mapping, as far as like the deep seas considered and research in the deep sea, can you share with us a little bit more about your experience and research with that? Um, because there's so much unknown, it's always, and every expedition is a form of exploration. Mm -hmm. um, and my research is m mainly focused on, on the seabed mm -hmm. um, and particularly on complex deep sea environments, like these submarine canyons, vertical walls, cold water coral reefs and so mm -hmm. on. 
but I think there is also a very large component of the water column. Mm -hmm. like, um, that's all deep sea, that's all an ecosystem, and we know so little about it. Um, it's also more difficult to grasp that water column because mm -hmm. um, a lot of the uh, seabed related fauna is um, attached, and so, <laughs> but the water column, it all constantly moves. So, um, in addition to the spatial question that I try to answer with my maps, mm -hmm. you also have the temporal question because things migrate all the time. Um, so that's a super exciting, um, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, as far as like collaborations concerned in your kind of work, what are some uh, of the things that you collaborate on and work with other researchers regarding habitat mapping? Um, marine research, particularly if you start going to deep sea, it's collaborative. Mm -hmm from start to finish um, and I, I really love that aspect because um, you work with people from all over the world with people with different backgrounds as I mentioned we try to do a very integrated uh, approach multidisciplinary mm -hmm. looking at different angles so it's always interesting to learn about the, the aspects you don't know that very well mm -hmm. um, so yeah um, being part of European programs, um, being part of national programs with people in different um, expertise. Um, some of the research is more applied, uh, for example, the impact of, um, we, we also have projects on the impact of offshore wind farms or um, how the habitat changes after decommissioning of oil and gas uh, infrastructure, for example. But um, some uh, some other projects are pure blue skies research, like mm -hmm. how does a submarine canyon work or how does a hydrothermal vent work? Like that. Mm -hmm. Are there any technology advancements that you're excited about or things that you think would help you do your job better and your research better? <laughs> I'm super excited about all the technology. Um, I have been very, very lucky to work here at the National Oceanography Center because we have a, a superb um, group of engineers working in marine autonomy and robotics. And I've had the, the I've been in the lucky position that I've been able to work with them for several years. And we um, we discuss uh, potential solutions to to questions. So actually they helped me to develop the capability of mapping vertical walls um, using the, the echo sounders in an in a innovative way, um, but the ROV team and the AUV team. And um, so we have a lot of interaction. Uh, I ask them a question and then they think about the solution and the next expedition, mm -hmm. we, can, we can try that. So that's, that's super exciting. Um, and I know they're working on lots of different uh, technical solutions still. Um, I think uh, one of the areas that um, can still be explored a lot in terms of technological development is um, we're getting better and better sensors to measure what happens in the water column and to um, photograph or map out what happens on the sea floor. What happens in the sediment, it's the next frontier, I think, for technology. Um, there is a certain amount of acoustics that you can do, but mm -hmm. uh, then, yeah, finding out what happens in the sediment is, is the next one, I think. Do you have any questions specifically related to the sediment or like what you'd want to know is going on in the sediment? Um, partly uh, from an ecosystem point of view uh, or ecology point of view, there's also animals that live in the sediment <laughs> that are not so easy to photograph. <laughs> um, and so like, yeah, trying to gather um, composition of benthic communities uh, in, in the sediment. Um, and maybe we can do some of that with eDNA that we can measure in in, um, in the sediment pore water or something like that. Um, and then also there is a lot of dynamics also in the sediment in certain places, um, fluxes of water with nutrients uh, or other components uh, that come from deeper or that go through um, if you sit on the slope and so on. So those are the, the parameters that need to be measured as well. Gotcha. Are there any other like key research findings or things that you'd want to share with people that are new or up and coming? <laughs> um, key research findings? Well, in the last expedition, the Submarine Canyon, um, what we learn is that um, disturbance in the ocean can um, happen very quickly. One of the sediment flows can come by or a deep sea bottom trawler comes by and everything is disturbed. Recovery 
happens very slowly. It takes years, decades for ecosystems to build themselves again. But it does, it does happen. We have evidence of new coral growing and uh, in some locations, but um, it takes a long time. So we should think twice before we add additional disturbance to the deep sea. Gotcha. And so, so you mentioned um, one of the key things is going back to those places. So mm. um, you're, I guess, in a way, you can look at when a, a flow has happened and then kind of what the impacts are afterwards. That's the idea behind it. But because expeditions take time to prepare, um, also what happens in the sea, deep mm -hmm. sea, um, as I said, the disturbances go fast, but the recovery goes slowly. So it's a, it's a long process. Mm -hmm. um, it takes years to decades to really document it all. Yeah. Do you think anything like autonomous robots or things like that will come in handy for some of that research where you can't get back out there with a ship or something like that? For sure. I mean, we are we are looking at um, doing some of that surveying with robots sent from shore. Totally. Yes, exactly. Gotcha. Yep. All right. Well, thank you for joining me today, Ver Verla. To find out more about habitat mapping, follow the link in the description where you can access the latest edition of Eco Magazine. And make sure to subscribe to Into the Blue on your favorite podcast app to ensure you don't miss out on part three coming in October 2023. See you soon.